afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in 2017. Our business today is an evidence session on governance of the Scottish Police Authority. And can I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and Don McGilvery, Head of Police Division, Scottish Government, to the meeting. And can I refer members to Paper 1, which is a note by the clerk, and Paper 2, which is a private paper. And we're going to move directly to questions, but before I, I do that, I would like to declare an interest as a member of the selection panel for the next chair of the Scottish Police Authority. And Cabinet Secretary, I understand that as a, a member of the selection panel, I am bound by the Code of Practice for Ministerial Appointments for Public Bodies, and that all the information that I am privy to is confidential. And I would appreciate it if you could confirm that my role in the selection panel does not in interfere with my role as convener of this subcommittee and any future scrutiny of the SPA and the performance of its chair, and you will keep Parliament up to date on the process and its outcome. Uh, good afternoon, Convener. Uh, as uh, members of the committee will be aware, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life uh, regulates this particular appointment, and Scottish ministers and panel members are bound by the Commissioner's Code of Practice. Uh, applicants for public appointments are, of course, entitled to uh, expect confidentiality, and all panel members must abide uh, by that. As a consequence, uh, panel members are not able to discuss the appointment process uh, and the information that any panel member becomes privy to is confidential uh, to that process. Uh, as uh, it, members will be aware, having received representation from uh, justice spokespersons from uh, the parties in Parliament, uh, I made an offer for the convener or a representative uh, to become a panel member, recognising that there are safeguards within the code to protect the integrity of the appointment process itself. Uh, for example, all uh, panel members uh, declare to their fellow panel members any conflicts of interest that may have uh, that, they, that they may have uh, that are relevant to their participation uh, as a panel uh, member. Uh, in accepting the offer, uh, uh, Convener, you have uh, agreed to accept the code uh, and the confidenti confidentiality that is required as part of that. Uh, I am, of course, happy to rely on the Convener's judgment uh, that it will not interfere with her role as Convener of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing and any scrutiny of the SPA Chair. Of course, it is for the panel to uh, identify appointable candidates. Uh, the decision, though, uh, on the appointment of the chair is for Scottish ministers. Um, the officers of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life um, would uh, be happy to provide the committee with further information um, on the public appointment process if the subcommittee felt that would be uh, useful. Uh, in relation to your final point, uh, Convener, uh, in line with the Commissioner's Code, uh, all appointment decisions will be publicised by Scottish Ministers. Uh, the SPA Chair uh, 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 will be announced uh, on the Scottish Government's website and appointed for Scotland. Uh, the announcement will include the name of the appointee, a short description of the body, a brief summary of the skills, knowledge and experience that the individual brings to the role, the length of term of appointment, the remuneration, uh, whether the individual holds any other appointments, and if so, what these are, and the amount of remuneration for each, and the activity noted in the political activity form completed by the individual appointed. And therefore, uh, the uh, announcement of the appointment will be uh, is set out by the code from uh, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm grateful for that um, clarification, Cabinet Secretary. Before I bring in other members, can I just ask if you're satisfied that the rules and responsibilities of the SPA, as set out in the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012, are still fit for purpose? Yeah, I believe they are. Um, uh, there may be issues about how uh, some of those rules have been taken forward, uh, but the uh, uh, role of the SPA in uh, holding uh, our police service to account and scrutinising the role uh, that they take forward as a, a key uh, public body, uh, delivering uh, an important public service, um, I believe remains relevant. And the existing arrangement with the SPA of that responsibility um, is, uh, is still relevant and appropriate today. Okay, thank you. Rona. 
Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I ask you if you're satisfied that the SPA has taken the necessary steps to raise awareness across the justice and political arena regarding its specific role with regard to governance? And have you been involved in any discussions as to how successful the SPA, SPA has been in this endeavour? Well, the, uh, there's a number of members of the, the SPA who engage with a range of different stakeholders um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, some of them have particular lead responsibilities in key areas and will engage with various stakeholders in relation uh, to those uh, particular matters, whether that be, for example, uh, trade union representatives or whether it be uh, those who engage with local scrutiny committees as uh, well. So there's, a, a, there's already arrangements in place for how the, the SPA uh, take that forward. Um, you'll be aware that uh, in the, the recommendations that were made by the uh, HMICS in the review uh, of uh, uh, governance with the, and uh, the openness of the process that the SPA had in place, that it made a, a number of recommendations and that the SPA have now got a, an action plan in place and a process in place with HMICS to make sure that those uh, recommendations are being taken forward in order to strengthen these matters uh, further uh, and for the S and for the HMICS to be satisfied that progress has been made on these issues. Um, my recollection is that there's a number of those recommendations have already been uh, uh, completed and progress has been made on the others. So, um, uh, uh, so there is a process there for, for SPA and for its members to engage directly with a range of different stakeholders. Uh, and uh, uh, can that be strengthened? I have no doubt that that is something that they, they should continue to look at and to make sure that they are seeking to strengthen it where that can be achieved. There will be times when particular issues arise where they will have a particular focus on engaging with a particular um, a, a group of stakeholders around a particular matter. Um, so, for example, um, uh, the decision that the SPA are making around the proposal around the uh, uh, the contact centre in Inverness has involved the SPA being engaged with stakeholders in that area. Um, the board meeting is taking place there, um, but there's been an extensive level of uh, engagement with uh, various stakeholders in that area prior to uh, having the board meeting to make a decision on that matter. And I would expect that type of approach to continue going forward. Okay, thank you. Ben. Just, just a supplementary, Cabinet Secretary. With regard to the, the specific role of the SPA and uh, the conceptual idea of the creation of the SPA in the 2012 Act. Um, it was, of course, established to provide an arm's length body to hold the Chief Constable to account, whilst providing a clear separation between politics and policing. <coughs> and, of course, as an issue, there's, it's been quite heavily covered in the political arena uh, the, 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 the concerns around the SP. I just wondered in terms of going forward how important it is to you and the government that the SP does play that role as a, a clear separation between politics and policing. Well, look, it'd be fair to say, first of all, is that policing is now uh, more political in Scotland than it has ever been, in my experience. And that's not just in uh, since I became Justice Secretary. Um, I've made the point on a number of occasions before, having spent... Uh, uh, an extensive period of time in this Parliament's uh, earlier Justice Home Affairs Committee and its Justice One Committee, and our regard to policing was extremely limited. Uh, in fact, I can't really recall us looking into policing matters to any great extent. It was largely because it was seen as being a matter for the local police boards uh, to uh, deal with. So the level of scrutiny and uh, political interest in policing now, in my view, is greater than I've ever experienced in, uh, in my whole time in this parliament. Uh, and that's, as I say, away from just uh, being uh, Justice Secretary. Um, but I think there's benefits that come from that uh, in, uh, in some of the challenge that comes from it and making sure that our police service is operating as effectively as possible, that it's responding to uh, concerns and issues that are being highlighted by Parliament and by parliamentarians. So I think there are strengths and benefits that come from that increased scrutiny and that increased uh, political accountability. Uh, but the, uh, the role of the, um, uh, the SPA, um, I think... Uh, it would be fair to say in recent years around the scrutiny of policing and the way in which it is scrutinising some of the changes that the police service has taken forward has improved. Uh, examples of that are demonstrated in, uh, in the uh, reports from HMICS. Uh, a particular example would be around the C3 change. 
uh, the way in which the, uh, the, the, the Police Scotland were taking that forward. And the, um, uh, the uh, report that I directed from HMICS highlighted a number of issues about how Police Scotland were taking that forward. Uh, the scrutiny process that has now been put in place by the SPA has ensured there is greater accountability and greater oversight around how that is being managed. Um, so it, I wouldn't be naive enough to say that from the outset that it has been perfect um, or that it is perfect as yet, but I do think it is improving um, and I'm confident that it will continue to improve uh, going forward because it's extremely important that an, uh, you know, a significant public service, such as the police service, and the trust that the public put in them and the role that they fulfil, uh, that there is appropriate accountability and scrutiny of the way in which the service has been managed, taken forward, and the decisions that the organisation is making as well. Um, and I would uh, expect that through the review that's been taken forward by the Deputy Chair, Nicola Merchant, and also Malcolm Burr, the Chief Executive of Western Isles Council, uh, will help to look at what further work uh, can be put in place to strengthen the role of the SPA in discharging that responsibility uh, and to make sure that they are getting the right support and the right information to allow them to undertake that role effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. John. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, panel. Cabinet Secretary, I have uh, a couple of questions around the current um, public appointments process for the SPA, but I'm not alluding to the letter and, um, from the... Um, so, uh, can you give your views on the, the, the current process, please, of public appointments to the SPA? So, the process, you, as in explaining the process? It, your views on it, is it, is it successful? Has it proved successful? Have you had representations? about the process? Well, the, 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 the appointment process for the for for um, the SPA, whether it be a, to be chair or whether it be to be a member of the SPA, is the same as it is for other public bodies where they are agreed by ministers. So, for example, our health boards are uh, another uh, example of an area where uh, it goes through the same uh, process. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I think if there is an issue about... If people are, uh, think there's a particular issue about the SPA appointment process... Uh, you have to be mindful of that this is reflective of what happens in other uh, public appointment rounds uh, as well. Now, I believe that that's uh, it's still an appropriate system uh, for, uh, going, uh, for going forward uh, within public appointments. Uh, if there is a desire for Parliament to have a wider debate around the whole issue of public appointments, then that's a, a separate issue. We, of course, have another appointment route, which is where Parliament appoint individuals. It, that, again, is set in statute, but it's uh, a different process for different types of bodies um, who have a different function. Uh, and it's a, a process, again, which I think uh, works, uh, um, it works well. So, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm conscious that people have got uh, issues around uh, particular individuals on the SPA, uh, but I don't think that in itself uh, would suggest that the system uh, of appointment is one uh, which is uh, not fit for purpose. Yes, well, I mean, this is without reference to individuals. It, do, do you consider the process to have been effective then? And have you had representations about the process? Well, I, I, it's effective in the appointment process in itself. Um, uh, the representations which I received was the letter that mm. came from the, uh, from the parties, but I haven't received representation beyond that about a, a desire to see the public appointment process uh, for the chair of the SPA or for any public body uh, that I make appointments to for it to be changed. Uh, without rehearsing, uh, if I may come in, uh, without rehearsing some of the challenges there's been about personnel there, do you think any of them have, uh, any of the issues that have arisen have dissuaded, I think indeed I asked you this in the chamber on one occasion, dissuaded any group from coming forward to seek appointment? I'm thinking particularly that the underrepresentation of women in ethnic minority groups. On well, that's um, uh, that's a challenge within the wider uh, public appointment process. And as a government, we've set out our desire mm. to see greater diversity and uh, a, a greater a greater number of uh, uh, women represented on our groups. And we've set a date of uh, 2020 where we want to see it 50/50 in our public bodies. In the justice side, it'd be fair to say that we have actually made significant progress um, across the areas which come under my portfolio responsibility. Um, if I recall, I, I can check this figure, but I think it's about 45% uh, 
um, of the appointments um, uh, have uh, have reflected that move towards trying to get 50-50 representation on a public board. So we are making progress. <coughs> I also wrote to the chair of the SPA actually earlier this year, uh, setting out the need to have greater diversity uh, uh, on uh, on the SPA. And uh, one of the options I've asked them to consider is to look at whether they can co-opt individuals uh, onto the SPA uh, on particular issues um, in order to help to address some of these issues, which I know that they are uh, going to give consideration uh, to. So. I think there's an issue about the public appointment process in general uh, and people applying to it. And I know there's been work done previously to try and make uh, uh, to make it more accessible and to encourage more people to uh, to apply to it for individuals from a, particularly from an ethnic minority. Um, uh, but I think that's a wider issue within public appointments rather than being specific to the SPA in itself. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Good afternoon. This is the third SPA chair that we're looking at in four years, so you'll be aware mm -hmm. that perhaps there's a perception the selection process so far hasn't been altogether successful. I think there is an acknowledgement of that to an extent in the First Minister's response and the Cabinet Secretary's statement um, that he'd spoken to Justice Spokesman and, as the First Minister had indicated, in First Minister's questions, the Scottish Government was not unsympathetic to the Parliament's wish to have a role in the appointment of the SP Chair. You then went on to say in your statement, 12th of September, Cabinet Secretary, that you would be in touch with Justice Spokesman within the next few days. Now, I think it was a clear expectation that you would speak to each of these um, Justice Spokesmen. Did you do so? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, what I did was I wrote to Claire Baker, who was the lead person who uh, wrote to me, uh, with, uh, which was supported by the other justice spokespersons, uh, and responded directly to her on the matter. Uh, given the time it was involved in this, that seemed to be the most appropriate way in which to try and expedite this process uh, and to ensure that there was an opportunity for, uh, for uh, feedback from justice spokespersons on that. So um, it seemed that would be the quickest way in which to deal with it. So the letter merely said that um, everyone was agreed, each justice spokesman was agreed that the Parliament should have a greater role, but it didn't st stipulate how that should happen. And there was certainly, I can tell you, from um, some of the spokesmen, uh, a real expectation there would be a discussion in that, but that didn't take place. Well, I, I responded with an offer to the justice spokespersons, and I, I responded to Claire Baker, who was the, the MSP who wrote to me on the issue, with supporting signatures from the other uh, party members, uh, proposing what would be an offer uh, to try and take the issue forward. I, I don't, I'm not entirely clear what, what the issue would be the in point dealing is with it that it way. was a clear expectation, Cabinet Secretary, that this would be discussed, albeit you will we'll get on to why there was um, some haste in this, uh, time uh, sensitive, I think, or whatever you've just said. Um, but that wasn't done, and I think that's that's a mission with the benefit of hindsight. Don't you think that would have been a better way to approach it? Every single spokesman to make sure that they were um, well, I think contacted if you, as it seemed to be, to say I would be in touch with the justice spokesman within so the next few days. I'm comfortable with how I dealt with it, given the time frame uh, that we had. This is a live process which is already taking place. The closing date for the applications to this process was last week. Uh, there was a, a very limited amount of time in order to be able to agree this because it has to, all those who are applying for it have to be notified that there has been a change to the process. Plus, at the same time, it also has to be agreed with the commissioner. So given the time pressures and the desire that members had to be involved in the process, uh, that's why I took it forward in the way in which I did. And I'm comfortable with the approach that I've taken on the matter. But didn't you set the, the timetable, Cabinet Secretary? Well, the, the, the time, do, you, do you mean the timetable for the appointment process? Absolutely. The process when, was already... When the, the date was appointed 21st of, um, 21st of August. The process was already started by then. 
The, pro the letter, the letter I received, the, 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 the appointment process had already started by the time that I had actually received the letter, and also the process had actually been approved by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards. So when did the process start? Margaret, I think that's the before, before I bring the Cabinet Secretary back in, I think we need to be mindful of the statements that were made at the beginning of this meeting and, and the, um, the statement that the Cabinet Secretary made. Um, and, and questions about this particular process are, are not suitable to ask. I find that absolutely astounding, convener, that a simple question like, when did this process begin, can't be answered, because it's very important, Cabinet Secretary. You may recall that on the 22nd of June, I brought up this very issue of the appointment and suggested during this very subcommittee meeting with HMICS that perhaps we should look at an appointment process similar to that of other public appointments like the FOI um, Commissioner and the Scottish Public um, ser uh, Service Ombudsman, where four uh, members of the main parties are in the, the process. There's an independent assessor. It's chaired by the presiding officer. And um, the appointments there all seem to have been very successful. At the very least, I would have thought that was reasonable to consider and make sure that we were f as fully transparent as accountable as we could. And in terms of the, the founding legislation and the statutory requirement, Quite frankly, if the political will is there, an amendment to that could have been made when Parliament reconvened. Just before you come back in, um, Cabinet Secretary, the Cabinet Secretary has outlined the process. The process has been agreed um, and we have given a commitment that the specific um, details of this process will not be questioned today and I think we have to respect that. John. I just wonder, um, and through yourself, Chair, um, I, um, I think Margaret's comments would be better directed to our, our party representative, who was a co-signature with myself and others. And, and I have to say, there is no mystery about this. Uh, I, I understand the process. I, I accept the offer that was made. And I, I don't know whether the Cabinet Secretary is able to say whether any of the other party representatives have subsequently made representations. I understood that to be agreed. So I, I, I think Margaret should be... Um, I can confirm I have spoken with the, chas uh, my, the, the party spokesman from my party, and the views I'm reflecting are his views for clarification. If I could Cabinet perhaps Secretary, move you want on. To come back in? Uh -huh. I have not received any other representation other than the letter from Claire Baker on this issue, and I have not had any informal approaches from any other justice spokespersons. I may be referring to your statement. Can we move on, be in touch in the next few days, Cabinet Secretary. Can we move on? If I can issue? move on then to um, the next issue, which was the fact that the convener felt it necessary at the beginning of this meeting to make a declaration of interest and to ask the Cabinet Secretary's view which was to the effect, if I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that he was happy to rely on the convener's judgment that, it would, um, that, that her participating in the process would not interfere with the role uh, of the committee as convener. That falls short of uh, an absolute ringing endorsement. And I see you're smiling and you're looking um, quite puzzled, Cabinet Secretary, but I remind you, this is the third appointment in four years, and I think the public... And I think those in Police Scotland and all the people who uh, regularly look at the kind of um, problems, to, to put it mildly, that both the SPA and Police Scotland have had over the years would want you to make sure that you were putting in place the very best uh, selection process and one that was fully accountable and transparent. The Cabinet Secretary has answered questions about the, the, the panel and, and the process, and I think we need to move on now. That's your judgment, convener. I state by it, but I think there's a huge question about um, this line of questioning and how Can far we we've on? got to go for what I consider to be legitimate probing questions that the public deser um, deserves an answer to. Yeah, John. Point of order. I, 
I have to say, you know, this isn't a, this shouldn't be a party political issue, and this shouldn't be. This 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 is about respecting a process and accepting good faith um, information that's been shared. We've heard from the cabinet secretary that there have been no subsequent recommendations. I'm trying to imagine the situation of a senior uh, government uh, minister having representations from four parties and then subsequently being questioned by a member of one of these parties. We either had a collective approach, and my understanding was we did or we didn't. And certainly, I wish to put on record that I have no concerns about the process that's been followed. There Thank is an, a, a further issue about future arrangements, and that's, that's a totally different matter. But the present process, it's important that the very clear signal that's sent from this committee is that there is absolutely no question regarding the integrity of this process. Liam. I, I mean, I've not really agreed to that. I mean, John, I think, captures my understanding of the, of the process. A, a comment to add well, to this. in which case, I will go, I will go <laughs> on and, 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 and try to move the issue on, but I certainly I, I, I agree with John's understanding of the issue. Um, I, I think whatever the, 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 the situation in relation to um, previous uh, recruitment processes and, 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 and future um, recruitment processes, there can be little doubt that um, we have a, a board at the moment who um, I, I have lost, is about to lose um, senior members uh, of their number. So what assurances, what extra measures have been put in place um, to manage and, 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 and safeguard continuity in terms of the work of the, the SPA? A couple of things. One of the things that um, we arranged um, back in June was for the appointment of a deputy chair. Uh, which previously was not in place in order to help to support some of the work that the uh, chair takes forward. And it also gives an opportunity for, um, uh, for example, if members have got an issue about the way in which a chair is dealing with something, they've got an alternative person that they can actually take the matter up with. And that role was fulfilled by uh, uh, Nicola Merchant, and she's been heavily involved in a range of different issues since uh, taking on that particular role. The other thing was that um, the chair agreed that he would remain in post until his successor was appointed in order to allow there to be uh, a continuity and to continue to take forward the work of the board, particularly the significant work they're taking forward around the implementation plans for 2026. And the other aspect that uh, I presume members uh, you're referring to is the, 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 chair, the chief executive mm. of the SPA who's taking early retirement. Again, um, that uh, recruitment process for uh, an interim chief executive has already started uh, and is at a very advanced <coughs> stage and appointment is due to take place um, within the next couple of weeks to allow that again to make sure that uh, by the time the chief executive is due to leave is that the interim chief executive um, has been appointed and will very quickly be able to move into post. So um, what I've been keen to ensure is that there is not a gap in leadership. Uh, that we continue to have a chair and we continue to have a chief executive. Uh, the chair will remain in post until we uh, recruit the new chair. Uh, and alongside that, the, the, the recruitment process for the chief executive, which is a matter for the, for the SPA around the Scottish Government, is that that process started as quickly as possible so that an interim appointment could be, uh, be made. And that's at a very advanced stage and um, appointment should take place within the next couple of weeks. And that will allow the organisation then to, uh, to move forward. The other aspect, I think, from the SPA's point of view, uh, that will assist them is that with the appointment of a, a new chair, um, the uh, decision to make uh, to appoint an interim chief executive will allow the incoming chair to uh, uh, to assess the report that is completed by uh, Nicola Merchant and Malcolm Burr, looking at governance and support to the SPA board alongside phase two of the HMICS thematic uh, review of the SPA, which is due to take place uh, later on this year and should report by, uh, by the spring of next year, to look at these issues and then make a decision on what would be the most appropriate structure going forward to support the board um, and, to, uh, and to make sure that they have the right type of support uh, to inform their decision making. So, a combination of that continuity until the replacements are, are brought in, but alongside uh, the work that's been carried out by the review uh, uh, that I mentioned uh, and the HMICS uh, work will allow the incoming chair the opportunity uh, to evaluate, reevaluate the situation and then to make decisions on what they believe would be the best structure moving forward with so the organisation. You're, you're entirely confident that there, is, there will be a smooth um, transition and handover in, in this whole process? Well, part of the reason for the chair staying on until there's a new chair appointed was to allow that to happen, uh, to help to support that. And 
but in, uh, as you're aware, there's a, a very advanced stage in the appointment process now for the chair as well, uh, and also the work around uh, looking to appoint an interim chief executive is a very advanced stage. So, uh, there is all, any time there's a transition, there will always be some challenges that come with that. But I'm confident we've done as much as we can to try and help to smooth that process as much as we can and to support the board to allow it to be able to continue to discharge its responsibilities and to function and to take forward the work that's extremely important around 2026 uh, to shape its uh, agenda for the future. I mean, stepping apart from the, 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 the process for, for a second, um, you'll be aware that some of the concerns that arose around the transparency of the, the workings of the SPA uh, arose, at least in part, um, as a result of concerns amongst um, the chair and perhaps other members. Um, of the, the, the media reaction to it. Now, at the moment, SPA is, is understandably very much in the, the spotlight. Um, are, you, um, are you satisfied that the reassurances that we've had that the SPA um, are now committed to working in a more transparent uh, fashion uh, will be upheld through this process when, again, as I say, they, they, they find themselves very much in the public eye? Well, I am satisfied and I can already see it happening. So, for example, the board meeting that's taking place today, the papers for the board meeting were published on Monday of this week. I think most of them were published on Monday of this week. The, the other thing that, that, that is worth keeping in mind is that um, uh, I asked HMICS uh, back in June of this year to uh, look at the whole issue of uh, openness and transparency and how the SPA were operating. Um, HMICS made 11 recommendations. Uh, uh, the SPA have put an action plan in place, as is the case with HMICS recommendations, that before they can be discharged, HMICS need to be that satisfied that they've made progress against these matters. Uh, and from the update report I've, I've uh, been able to view is that progress has already been made against a number of those, um, those recommendations and they have a timeline for taking forward the other recommendations. So uh, we can already see the practical uh, 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 the practical experience of the changes which the SPA have put in place uh, and alongside that the additional scrutiny that HMICS offer uh, to the recommendations that they made and the action plan that's now been taken forward by the SPA and the way in which uh, that process is now being monitored by HMICS to make sure that it has been uh, progressed. And in the discussions I've had with uh, members of the SPA, uh, they've got a strong desire uh, to make sure to take these issues forward. Um, and uh, I'm confident they will. And uh, it will be obviously for the incoming chair to make sure that the organisation continue to make that progress going forward. Okay. John Foley, the Chief Executive, in evidence to the um, Justice Committee on the 7th of March, um, stated that he was, or confirmed he was a, a member of the Joint Programme Board um, in, uh, in relation to the integration of railway policing into uh, Police Scotland. Uh, he also made clear that he was um, uh, leading in a number of the, the, the key areas, um, the implementation plan, the forming the relationship with the railway organisations, uh, pensions, terms and conditions, and the uh, cost allocation models. Now, a number of those have been highly, highly uh, controversial. What confidence do you have um, that that work um, will continue, particularly against the backdrop of ongoing concerns being raised by uh, representatives of um, BTP um, staff and officers? One of the things that's happened since Parliament um, passed the legislation on the integration of BTP into Police Scotland is that the, the role of Police Scotland has increased in the Joint Programme Board and taking that work forward. So a significant amount of the work that was uh, being considered at that earlier stage by the SPA is now being taken forward by Police Scotland uh, because of the operational responsibilities which they have. Uh, the reason that change has happened is because Parliament has set down the legislation as that's the approach that's, that we're now going to integrate it. So that allowed Police Scotland to take up that greater role um, as well. I'm also uh, confident that... Uh, the, and, and I should also say that's also allowed um, uh, British Transport Police uh, to take a, big, a much bigger role in the, uh, in the ongoing development work as well. Uh, I, I'm, I'm confident in that uh, the, 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 the work that's already been taken forward is making significant progress around some of the issues which you have uh, raised. Uh, will there continue to be issues that need to be raised, addressed going forward? Of course there will. 
uh, in any change of this nature. Uh, but you know, I'm also conscious that the uh, British Transport Police Federation uh, recognised uh, that um, uh, a number of weeks ago that progress has been made around uh, issues about terms and conditions, uh, and they welcome that. Uh, and that the Scottish Government are working with them, along with others, to make sure that they're updating their members as regularly as possible. Uh, so that work will go forward and continue to move forward. Uh, but what has happened now is that a greater part of that work has now been taken forward by Police Scotland. Um, uh, because Parliament has now uh, made it clear uh, its position in the matter, uh, and they are now taking a much greater part in the Joint Programme Board. Which, uh, by extension, would mean that the SPA is taking a, a diminished role in, in oversight of this process? Uh, the, the, some of the areas that the SPA were looking at at that point have now switched to Police Scotland because uh, Parliament's will is now clear on the issues. So, uh, and they are now leading in some of the issues that previously would have been considered by the SPA. Cabinet Secretary, one of the other things we, we, we've heard quite a lot of evidence um, from, and you, you'll be aware when Callum Steele has come to um, committee, he has given us quite substantial evidence about um, morale within within the police force. And, and I understand there's a lot of change going on within, within the police force, and, and Liam has, has indicated you know, the BTP, ongoing staffing issues, ongoing issues around um, legacy arrangements from... Um, previous forces. Um, are you confident that um, all the steps that have been put in place will um, be enough and sufficient to significantly impact on the low levels of morale in the force? Which steps are you referring to? Are you well, th there's, there's a number of different operational things that are, are taking place. There's a, there yeah, are a number of different work know, streams going on. There's a, there's a variety of different um, initiatives um, taken place. I, I'm, I'm probably referring less to a specific thing and more to the general picture of all the different work streams that are going on in, in, in the police force. Do you think that will have a negative impact or a positive impact? Well, look, there, there, there's a... There's a uh, these are operational matters yes, for Police Scotland, uh, that, as yes. you'll recognise. And, uh, and you, 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 you had evidence from Ian Livingston mm -hmm. um, uh, in the last couple of weeks indicating uh, his determination to, to take forward a range of measures and, and to acknowledge that uh, issues around morale um, uh, have uh, been a, a, an issue of challenge mm -hmm. for the organisation. I think, if I recall correctly, he characterised it as that they, uh, they, in moving forward, they didn't take their people with yes. them uh, to a large extent. And, and that, that, that probably is a reflection of what, what happened with a major change of this, uh, of this uh, nature. Having said that, I think anyone who's looked at major change programmes in the mm -hmm. past would say that that's a common occurrence in these types of of issues, but it's it's clearly had an impact on uh, on morale in the organisations. Um, one of the areas that I know that the the federation had raised was the whole issue about welfare mm -hmm. uh, and the well-being of its members uh, and what could be done to help to improve uh, the way in which Police Scotland are addressing these issues. And Ian Livingston has led in that particular work stream within the organisation, uh, which has resulted in a new uh, wellbeing policy being taken forward. It was piloted in Lanarkshire, if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, they were looking to roll it out to the rest of the country. And a key part of that has been bringing together staff representatives like the Federation to help to shape that policy. Now, will that turn around the organisation in terms of morale uh, tomorrow? Um, uh, that will take time. Um, uh, that will take time. What I I'm very confident about is uh, uh, that those within the executive team within Police Scotland uh, recognise the issue and want to turn these issues around and are determined to try and take forward measures that can assist in doing that. So, uh, although it's an operational matter, I certainly don't get the impression from the executive team in Police Scotland that they see this as being a low priority to them. They see it as being an important priority. Uh, and they're going to try to take forward measures that they believe it can assist them in addressing some of these issues. Um, however, the proof will be in the pudding. Uh, the proof will be in time, whether it does start to have a positive impact um, on their uh, uh, on morale. And, I, and there's a range of, in my experience, there's a range of probably smaller issues that could be addressed that would help to support some of these matters. And it can be down to small practical issues that the service can address and I know from the discussion I've had with the uh, members of the executive team, uh, they're actively considering how they can take some of these issues forward in the in the coming months to try and address some of these matters. But the wellbeing uh, policy work that the organisation has been taking forward, I think, also demonstrate the desire on the executive team to take forward some of the big issues uh, that can really help to support officers on a day-in, day-out basis. Okay, thank you. John. 
I know we're here about governance, but if perhaps you allow me a, a bit of latitude on, on this one, please. Can I say, we, we generally, when we talk about the Scottish Police Authority, we talk about the relationship with uh, yourself, with Police Scotland. There's another very important relationship that has a link to local policing, and that is the relationship with the local scrutiny boards. C has that been impacted um, as a result of some of the changes? Um, I know that there, my understanding is that there was liaison um, pe people within the board were given a geographic remit to cover. Are you aware of any? And, I, and I also, I understand that there's a wide range of different types um, of uh, local scrutiny boards. But that relation's pivotal too. No, I agree. And um, the member may recall that I, I hosted an event uh, to bring together all the chairs of the scrutiny committees to identify a range of measures that can be put in place to improve the way in which there was linkage between the local scrutiny committees, Police Scotland, and also uh, with the SPA at a national, uh, a national level. And there's a range of work that's been taken forward in order to strengthen that. One of the things that I do think has happened, um, uh, I, I should say, I think the way in which Police Scotland and local commanders are engaging with scrutiny committees has improved. And also the way in which local scrutiny committees uh, in some parts of the country are now scrutinising local police plans has improved. I think there's been a learning curve for members of local scrutiny committees as well in looking at these issues. So I think that has improved. And from the uh, uh, some of the discussion I've had with um, uh, 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 scrutiny committee members is that in some areas, they are more comfortable with how that is now working, the way in which local commanders and planning for matters and taking forward local policing plans and engaging with them, that has improved. And there's a better understanding around the role that the local scrutiny committee has in that particular process. There's also been a strengthening of the link between uh, the local scrutiny committees and also the, uh, the, uh, the SPA in itself. Is there, is, there an op is there potential to strengthen that yet further? I think there potentially is, um, and I uh, and I would like to see um, it, again. It will be the reviews taking been taken forward just now, and also there'll be a new chair coming in. I think there's an opportunity to uh, give a a more formalised direct input into the SPA from the local scrutiny committees. Would that be all of the uh, divisional scrutiny committees? Um, I suspect not, but there might there be a there'll be a structure under that that I think could be helped to support a direct line into the uh, to the SPA, um, and I think that could be considered in the forward, in going forward, and I think that would strengthen that local accountability and that tie even more so. So, has it improved? Yes. Is there scope to improve it further? I believe there is, and I think there are some ways in which that could be strengthened going forward. But I don't want to preempt the new chair coming in to give them an opportunity to look at these issues and also the uh, 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 the review that's taking place just now. But I do think there are opportunities to do that. Thank you. Liam. No, I mean, I can understand why you wouldn't want to preempt the new chair coming in, but um, I, I don't feel quite so um, uh, conscribed in, in terms of what uh, I'm prepared to say at this stage. I'm certainly of the view that the relationship between local scrutiny committees and the SPA is, is not acting in the way that it, it, it should. I constantly hear um, complaints about the, the lack of responsiveness uh, from within the SPA to local scrutiny committees. So I'd, I'd certainly welcome um, uh, the, the incoming chair and uh, his or her colleagues taking this up as, as something uh, of a, a priority. There's, there's also concerns, I think, being raised around the number of acting and temporary roles, making it difficult sometimes for local scrutiny uh, committees mm. to get firm responses to some communications. Mm. I don't know if that's something that's been raised with you directly. Um, both I think, I think within, in relation to Police Scotland? Yeah, uh, not specifically in terms of those acting in temporary roles that I did. There was an issue, thing back where I, as a constituency member, there was a bit of frustration from um, uh, local community councils in that uh, officers were changing on a much more, on uh, a, 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 a frequent basis. Uh, and I've noticed that that settled down, that officers are spending longer in uh, these local community roles. Um, uh, just for example, is a, there is the there is now the there's the there's the national chair of the local scrutiny committees. One of the options could be is for them to be co-opted onto the SPA board, uh, to have that direct voice in there at an SPA level uh, for the chair of the uh, for the scrutiny committees across the country. It, that's something I think it could be explored uh, uh, to give that direct line in. 
Uh, and again, if there's a feeling from uh, uh, particular scrutiny committees that they're not getting the feedback that they believe that should they should be, then they have someone who actually is there that could raise that directly uh, within the board. So that's just an example. As I say, I'm not saying that that should happen because I want to give the new chair an opportunity to look at it, but I think it's one area that's worth exploring uh, uh, to see whether we could strengthen it further. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And just to, to bring us back to the, um, the, the process that we're, we're initially talking about, the appointment of the new chair, if Parliament were to be given a permanent role in, in the process to elect a new chair of the SPA, what impact would that have in terms of accountability? Well, you would need legislative change for that process. Um, and you would need legislative change uh, to the existing arrangements as a ministerial appointment. I think that begs the question is, um, why would the SPA chair uh, be different from that of a health board chair? Uh, uh, why would it be different from other public appointments um, as well? And that's an issue that would have to be explored and uh, discussed. But if, the, if there was a view that, uh, uh, that it should be uh, similar to some of the other bodies where Parliament makes the appointment, it is worth keeping in mind that those bodies have a different role. Uh, those bodies are very often responsible for holding government to account in various issues. Uh, and at the same time, their staff, as I recall correctly, are employed by the Scottish Parliament's corporate body as well, uh, because Parliament becomes responsible for them, which would raise issues around about... So the staff that, the S that are employed by the SPA, which is all your... For example, that would be all your forensic staff, the forensic services, hundreds of staff uh, and forensic services that they deliver, because they deliver, they're a service provider as well, would become the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament. That would be quite a departure from what we have for any of these other public bodies that Parliament makes appointment for at the moment, uh, which would all have to be explored and and considered in the in the round. So, um, uh, as I say, that, that's a that's a wider that's a wider issue around uh, uh, public appointments in themselves. Uh, and I would put out there, why would the SPA uh, chair be different from that of other public bodies, given the nature of its role and its responsibility? Because it's there to hold to account um, a major public body. Uh, it has a, a, a very significant uh, uh, budget uh, of taxpayers' money. Uh, that it needs to be held to account for, and that's why we have the existing structure in place. And again, that was an issue that was explored at the time when the legislation was going through Parliament, and this was viewed as being the most appropriate way in which we could create that proper line of accountability. OK. And have you had any discussions with Parliament officials around an exception to, to the process, specifically for the SPA chair? It, if we were to change the legislation? Yes. No, I haven't. Uh, I, I see the existing arrangement in, in yourself being on an interview panel as being an exception uh, to it, and that had to be agreed by the, uh, the Commissioner for um, uh, Ethical Standards uh, and Public Appointments. Um, uh, but the reason I haven't had that discussion is because um, uh, I'm not at the point where I'm saying that it should change to that process because there are a whole range of issues in there uh, that I don't think have been explored or considered uh, that would need to be considered uh, and looked at. Uh, alongside that of other public appointments in themselves. Okay, thank you. Liam? That up and turn it on its head, and, and as somebody who welcomed the offer you made in, in making an exception in this instance, um, I, I suppose should we get to the position where a, a future chair needs to be appointed, there'll be a process, and, and presumably there, there, is, there may well be a, a call from parliamentarians and justice spokespeople at that time, that if you did it, on this occasion, then why aren't you doing it on on the next occasion? Do you think that there's now a precedent that's been set that you say it as an exception, but actually it, it, it could de facto become the rule? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, the offer I made was a genuine one to try and recognise interest that um, the Parliament has in this issue. In this issue, uh, but it is with the exception because the existing arrangement for public appointments for other public bodies is the same as it is for the SPA. So. Um, I'm containing it within the SPA um, uh, a appointment process. Uh, I think having a, made the decision to uh, invite someone onto the interview panel on this occasion, it would inevitably raise questions about uh, any future appointment. Why would that not happen again in the future? Um, uh, I haven't given that consideration at this stage yet, largely on the basis that, uh, uh, that um, I'm hoping that an appointment uh, of a new chair of the SPA 
will be required for a while um, after this appointment process. If it's a successful completed. process, you know it makes the argument for so, uh, going down the same route next time. I'm very conscious of that <laughs> point as well, and it went through my mind at the time when I was making the offer. So, um, but I do think, uh, what you call, I do think there is some legitimacy to the, to the argument that it would be difficult to come back from this when it comes to the appointment of the of the chair. But I do think there is it is worth putting out there. There are quite wide issues that would have to be explored if there was a view that uh, this is an appointment that should be similar to that of the Freedom of Information Commission, as I say, because the SP employed hundreds of staff and deliver services such as forensic services for the police and the, and the Crown. Uh, and Parliament would become responsible for those services in a way that I'm not aware that other public bodies that go through the other appointment process where Parliament appoints them actually deliver such services. They're much more about accountability uh, and part of that is about holding Parliament to account. Okay, thank you. As there are no further questions from um, committee, can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for attending and also thank Don McGilvery for attending as well. Um, the next subcommittee will meet on the Thursday, the 26th of October, and I now close the 15th meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing. Thank you.